everyone and welcome to the Bill Lecture. So we will be going over some housekeeping slides shortly. We're just, uh, we're just getting the screen set up and ready to go. So welcome face to face and thank you for bracing all the rain and the weather. Equally, uh, thank you everyone for coming online. Um, just a bit of housekeeping to get us started. So we recommend if you're joining online, please um, position the speaker in the top right corner. You're going to get the best view doing it this way. Um, use the chat function. Alternatively, if you do have questions, you can pop them in the Q&A function as well. And we will do that through each presenter. We will go through the Q&A function and ensure that your questions are answered as much as possible. This session is being recorded. It will be available shortly after as well. Um, so if you miss anything, don't worry, you can go back and watch it again. Uh, we have an excellent event lined up. So we have Chris Potts, who has made the journey from Southampton uh, in questionable weather again today. So we're looking forward to that. And also we have Spiridon Online, um, who is our doctoral award winner from last year. So thank you everyone for joining us and enjoy the event. Thank you very much, Caitlin. And um, a very big welcome to this year's Bill Lecture. It's a special event in our 75th anniversary celebration. I am delighted to introduce our uh, speaker, Professor Chris Potts, a leading scholar and distinguished academic in OR. And Chris's talk titled Reflections on Half a Century of Research in OR will take us on a journey through the history um, and impact of OR on decision making. As is uh, customary for, for this event, we will have a talk by our doctoral award winner and um, before the Bill lecture. And this year's um, talk will be given by Dr. Spiridon Ogakiatis. Um, Spiridon's presentation will focus on his research um, with his presentation titled uh, A Regularized um, in Interior point method for convex programming. Solving complex mathematical problems efficiently is crucial in, in various fields. Um, and Spiridon is going to share with us the brilliant work that he has um, done or he did for his PhD. Uh, Spiridon is currently a lecturer in mathematics at the School of Science and Engineering at the University of Dundee. He received his PhD um, in optimization and OR from the School of Mathematics um, at the University of Edinburgh in 2022. So Spriden, the floor is yours. Hello, and thank you very much. I'm really honored to give a talk at this year's field lecture. So uh, give me one moment to share my screen. Okay. Right, so uh, is my screen okay? Right, so, okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And um, today I will introduce some work that I did during my PhD studies. Specifically, it is a regularized interior point method uh, for, with applications to convex optimization. So, this work, naturally, uh, we're interested in convex optimization problems. So the idea here is we would like to solve, uh, to minimize a function f, which is assumed to be twice continuously differentiable and convex, subject to some linear equality constraints, as well as some convex conic constraints. Now, these types of problems appear are ubiquitous in applications, and there is a very good reason for that. On the one hand, Convex optimization enables great modeling capabilities, but on the other hand, it is also amenable to efficient optimization. Now, we would like to be able to solve these types of problems efficiently and reliably. And typically, we expect that convex optimization problems would appear as subproblems of some more complex model that could be non convex, for example. And for that reason, we want to find solution methods that can actually solve these problems accurately with minimal supervision because we do not want to be changing our convex optimization solver every time a new problem appears. 
So, of course, there is a very fruitful research area that is very active the last 70 years on deriving efficient methods for convex optimization. And the most popular approach is to utilize some first order method. And of course, these are extremely popular because they are very cheap in terms of memory requirements. So they are scalable and they're also quite easy to analyze and implement. The issue, however, is that they typically lack the ability of finding accurate solutions. And if they, even if they do for certain problems, they're not as reliable as we would like them to be. On the other hand, um, a very popular approach is to use a second order augmented Lagrangian method or some variant of the proximal point method. Now, these are actually able to find accurate solutions and extremely efficiently. However, they are efficient for some problems, but not so good for others. In, in particular, they're not as reliable as we would like them to be. Of course, they are more reliable than first order methods, but still they're, they're, we, we would like something more reliable in practice. And of course, these are second order methods, so they're also quite memory intensive. Finally, we have the class of interior point methods. And actually, these are state of the art in terms of efficiency. Specifically, you can there is the polynomial complexity of interior point methods for a wide class of convex optimization problems. And they have also been demonstrated to be extremely reliable. And this is the reason why most commercial solvers make use of interior point methods. Again, these are second order methods, so they are also quite memory intensive. But additionally, they do struggle with numerical stability. Specifically, interior point methods introduce the so-called logarithmic barriers to deal with conic constraints. And the magnitude of the logarithmic barriers increases indefinitely as we're approaching an optimal solution, creating numerical instability issues. So during my PhD, the idea was to create a robust, efficient, and scalable interior point method. And anyone that has worked on optimization would immediately, uh, would immediately observe that these three objectives are actually conflicting because, for example, if you have a very efficient interior point method that is polynomially convergent, you most likely need to utilize second order information, which means that the method is not going to be very scalable. And on the other hand, if you create, let's say, a first order type interior point method, then the method might be scalable, but not efficient or robust. So we have to strike a great balance between these three objectives. So to to answer this uh, problem uh, as good as we can, we derived a regularized interior point method, which I will present in this talk. So first, I will start with introducing the algorithm and hopefully convince you that we are uh, designing the algorithm to improve the robustness of standard interior point methods. And then I will briefly discuss its convergence properties so, that, so as to show that the, the resulting method is actually efficient. Then I will also discuss a, a bit about iterative linear algebra, which is used in our method to reduce memory requirements so as to improve scalability. Finally, I will present some numerical results on some linear and convex quadratic programming test sets, as well as on, on some nonlinear image restoration instances. And of course, I will discuss some open research questions. So starting with the derivation of the method, you should always remember the three objectives, that is robustness, efficiency, and scalability. And indeed, um, the first thing we wanted to tackle was actually improving the robustness of interior point methods, which is achieved by improving their numerical stability. So the first question we wanted to answer is how can we improve the numerical stability of interior point methods? And it is known that you can do this by utilizing a technique called regularization. Specifically, what you can do is that you can combine a traditional IPM with a proximal method of multipliers. This is why we actually term the method an interior point proximal method of multipliers. Of course, for those of you who are not aware, a proximal method of multipliers is essentially a primal dual augmented Lagrangian method. So regularized interior point methods are by design hybrid schemes. And to derive the method, I will focus on a simpler formulation. So I will focus on convex quadratic programming problems. 
unless stated otherwise. So in this case, the cone is just the non-negativity orthant and the function f is just a convex quadratic. Now to arrive at our method, I will first introduce a mixed barrier augmented Lagrangian scheme, and I will use this to derive our interior point proximal method of multipliers. So typical augmented Lagrangian schemes always start with some estimate of a primal dual solution. So zeta zero is an estimate of the primal solution and eta zero is an estimate of the Lagrange multipliers corresponding to the equality constraints. Then at every iteration, we have to choose some parameters. So mu is a parameter for the barrier, so the logarithmic barrier terms, and rho and delta are the primal and dual penalty parameters or regularization parameters associated with the augmented Lagrangian method. Using all these, we actually form a penalty function, which is a mixed barrier augmented Lagrangian penalty, that looks like this. And if you ignore the blue term, this is the standard augmented Lagrangian penalty that is typically uh, associated with augmented Lagrangian methods. And we're simply appending some logarithmic terms, and this is why we call this a mixed barrier penalty. So the idea in augmented Lagrangians is to minimize the the penalty function with respect to x, and then update the update y using a dual ascent step. Once this is done, then you can update the primal dual estimates and continue. So here we observe that the, the third step, in particular, the minimization of the penalty function can be written in terms of its optimality conditions. And we can combine these two steps into a single system of nonlinear equations. And we can do this, and we and thus we obtain this nonlinear system of equations, which we need to solve at every iteration k, at least approximately. Now, again, I have highlighted in blue two terms here. And if you ignore these two terms, you can observe that this nonlinear system of equations is exactly the system that appears within standard traditional interior point methods. And we call those uh, nonlinear systems the IPM barrier subproblems. So here we have a perturbed IPM barrier subproblem because we have the two terms associated with the augmented Lagrangian. So the idea here is instead of solving this, this, this system exactly, we follow traditional interior point schemes and approximately solve it using a so-called neighborhood scheme. And of course, this will in turn inform how we will update our estimates zeta and eta as well as our penalty parameters. So typical interior point methods apply a single Newton iteration to the previous system of uh, nonlinear equations. So the way they work is that you choose a centering parameter, sigma, which um, is between 0 and 1, and sigma predicts how much uh, the barrier parameter is going to decrease in the next iteration. And of course, the barrier parameter mu, as it approaches 0, we're actually approaching the optimal solution. So using the centering parameter, we apply a single uh, step of damped Newton method, in fact, and we obtain this system of linear equations, which we have to solve at every iteration. So on the left-hand side, we have the Jacobian, and you can observe that the regularization stabilizes the Jacobian and ensures that this matrix is always going to be invertible, irrespectively of the rank of the matrix A. On the other hand, the centering parameter sigma predicts the decrease of the barrier parameter, but also predicts the decrease of the primal dual regularization parameters as well. And that's going to be extremely important, and I will explain why in a moment. So this is a neighborhood scheme because once we approximately solve the system, we have to find the step length so that the new iterate belongs to an appropriate neighborhood. And I have highlighted this because this is actually, I'm not going to go into the details, but this is actually the key behind polynomial complexity of interior point methods. Now, concerning how we tune the barrier parameter, we can use this complementarity type equation. This is a well-known uh, equation from interior point methods. However, we note that the centering parameter sigma predicts the same decrease for the regularization parameters as well. So we set the regularization parameters to be of the same order of magnitude as the barrier parameter. So we don't need to worry about tuning the regularization for specific problem classes. Finally, we update our estimates 
in this for in this manner only we have sufficient residual reduction but i'm not going into the details because that also relates to the neighborhood so this is the core idea behind our scheme of course i've, I've hidden several details and I have to mention that when we started working on regularized IPMs, there were already considered similar schemes in the literature. And it was known that they exhibit better numerical stability and thus robustness compared to standard IPMs. However, there was very limited theoretical understanding of these methods. Specifically, it was believed that the moment you introduce regularization in standard IPMs, you obtain a more robust method but you're actually losing efficiency because there was an open problem of whether such a scheme can actually achieve polynomial convergence. So if robustness is, uh, results in losing uh, polynomial convergence, so we're gaining robustness to lose efficiency. And we want, if you remember the three objectives, we want to have both robust and efficient methods. Well, thankfully, we found an appropriate neighborhood and we're able to show that if the constraint matrix has full row rank and the problem admits a bounded solution, our method is actually polynomially convergent. And this was the first polynomial complexity result for a primal dual regularized IPM. Now, this was shown for the class of convex quadratic programming problems, but we were able to extend the result for linear positive semi-definite programming problems as well. Importantly, the result holds even if the Newton system that we have to solve at every iteration is solved inexactly. And that's going to be important later on when I discuss how we can decrease the memory requirements of our method. Before I move on to iterative linear algebra, I should mention that uh, as a byproduct of the theory, under the assumption that the problem that we're trying to solve does not satisfy strong duality, you can actually show that a necessary condition for this is that either of these two sequences has to grow unbounded. And from our algorithmic design, we know that this means that our estimates will stop being updated after a finite number of steps, which can help us detect pathological cases. So this has been a long line of work during my PhD studies. And so far, what we have achieved is that we obtain a method that is both robust because we regularize it so we don't have to worry about uh, rank deficiency of the constraints or other uh, intricacies. And at the same time, it's still polynomially convergent for a wide class of convex optimization problems. So it's both robust and efficient. However, there was a third goal which, has, uh, which relates to scalability. And for that reason, I, will, I want to briefly discuss about iterative linear algebra for the solution of the Newton system. So the major bottleneck in IPMs in general, so I now I have uh, gone back to the general convex optimization problem. The major bottleneck in IPMs is actually the solution of the Newton system at every iteration. And of course, in this form, this is not an easy system to solve because it is non-symmetric. So typically what you do is that you pivot delta Z to obtain a symmetric system, which we call the augmented system. And in this case now, the coefficient matrix is symmetric and has a saddle point form. Now, observe that the moment we pivot delta Z, a new matrix appears in the 1-1 one -one block, which we call theta. This is actually called the IPM scaling matrix. And it is the culprit behind numerical instability of IPMs. This is a diagonal matrix that as we're approaching optimality, contains diagonal elements approaching zero while others approaching infinity. And of course, here you observe that regularization prevents the conditioning of the system from exploding. However, in the non-regularized case, the conditioning can, can become as, as large as, uh, it has actually no limit on how large it can become. So, so here, the, the idea is to, to solve um, this Newton system efficiently while also knowing that the conditioning will deteriorate at every iteration. Another thing to note is that in the case where we're dealing with separable optimization problems, in which case the Hessian of F is actually a diagonal, it might be a good idea to further pivot delta X to obtain a positive definite system of equations, which we call the normal equations, so here, in this case, the coefficient matrix is positive definite. 
And um, I should just mention that we only saw the normal equations in, in the case of separable optimization. Otherwise, we always saw the augmented system. And this is why I have highlighted these two systems. So the idea here is that we need to solve this Newton system accurately and efficiently. And this is important for ensuring that our method with inexact or iterative linear algebra is going to be polynomially convergent still. But at the same time, we would like to control the memory usage of our method, which can help with the scalability of our approach. And indeed, typical methods actually utilize factorization. And this includes also commercial solvers. So you can use an LDLT decomposition for the augmented system or a Cholesky decomposition from the normal equations. The issue, however, is that this is not is prohibitive for large scale problems because of memory requirements, in which case we have to utilize iterative linear algebra. Specifically, we utilize Krilov subspace solvers because these are very well studied and highly efficient. And additionally, they can be accelerated by uh, using a technique called precondition. So preconditioning, thinking of a linear system, you can, you can think of preconditioning as, let's say, pre-multiplying this linear system by an invertible matrix, obtaining an equivalent system that has better condition. And this actually accelerate, accelerates Krilov subspace solvers because their convergence is directly affected by the conditioning of the linear system we're trying to solve. Now, just as a side note, we are using the preconditioned conjugate gradient method for the normal equation or the, or the minimum residual method for the augmented system. However, note something. As I said before, the Newton systems that we need to solve become increasingly ill-conditioned as we're approaching the optimal solution, i.e. as mu approaches zero. And as I said, the culprit is the diagonal scaling matrix theta the good news is that we have the regularization terms that prevent the conditioning of the system from exploding. However, we have further good news because regularization enables us, enables the efficient creation of effective and general preconditioners. And I want to showcase that with two simple examples of preconditioning strategies. So I will focus on the normal equations here just to show you how we can precondition the system utilizing the regularization. So for the normal equations, we have this coefficient matrix. And remember, I said we only solve the normal equations if the Hessian is diagonal. So let me consider only this approximated normal equations matrix where the Hessian of F has been substituted by its diagonal. So to create an effective preconditioner for this matrix, we, we use a very simple idea. We observe that this matrix G inverse is diagonal and we can simply approximate this matrix by another matrix E. Okay, so what is E? So E is again a diagonal matrix whose ith diagonal element has the value zero if the respective ith diagonal element of G inverse is of the same order of magnitude as mu. So it gets smaller and smaller as we're approaching the optimal solution. And otherwise it assumes the value of G inverse. Now, why is that important? Essentially, you can observe that by setting to zero a diagonal element in matrix E, we're throwing away an entire column from matrix A. And from interior point theory, we know that throughout all iterations, about half of the columns or half of the elements of matrix E will be about zero, which means that we're throwing away half of the data and Thus, you can observe that factorizing this matrix is significantly more cheap than factorizing the normal equations directly. Of course, for a, a note that this can, is possible only because we have regularization. Because if we didn't have this uh, delta term here, throwing away arbitrary columns of A is not a good idea because it might easily result in a preconditioner that is not invertible. Now, to assess the quality of this preconditioner, we have to show that the eigenvalues of the preconditioned matrix P inverse M will be close to one. And we, we were able to show that the eigenvalues of this system are actually greater or equal than one and smaller than one plus a constant. Now, this constant on the upper bound contains a term nu over delta. And from our algorithmic design, 
this is order one, which means, as we say, that the preconditioner is optimal. What we mean by optimal is that the conditioning of this, pre of this uh, matrix here is independent of the iteration of the interior point method. And this is extremely important because, as I said in the beginning, the Newton systems of interior point method become increasingly ill-conditioned as we're approaching the optimal solution. So, of course, for separable optimization, the normal equations are equal to M tilde, so we use this preconditioner for PCG, but we also utilize this for the non-separable case, and briefly I will just uh, show you how. So, in the non-separable case, we have we solve the augmented system that has a coefficient matrix of this form, and the idea here is very simple. We use a positive definite block diagonal preconditioner, where the one-one block is approximated by this matrix, where we simply approximate the Hessian by its diagonal, and the sur complement here is approximated using the preconditioner I discussed for the normal equations. And again, we were able to show that this preconditioner is also optimal. So this is the work in which we derived these two preconditioners and successfully uh, showcased that they, uh, they, they, they give very efficient uh, and scalable uh, regularized interior point method. Now, the takeaway message here is that the regularization helps us with preconditioning, apart from, all, from also introducing numerical stability. And to showcase that, we have developed several extensions of the previous preconditioners, including techniques for incorporating low rank updates, dealing with dense rows or columns of matrix A, which actually can be quite cumbersome when you're factorizing uh, the, system, the Newton system, and also incorporating non-diagonal Hessian information. And this was uh, covered in a second publication relating preconditioning. Now, these preconditioners and iterative linear algebra techniques I've mentioned are general purpose. They do not depend on the structure of the problem we are trying to solve. However, we observe that actually, if you want to specialize a regularized interior point method to a specific application, the only thing you have to change is the preconditioning. And we were able to do this quite successfully for portfolio selection problems, classification of MRI data, image restoration tasks, as well as log logistic regression tasks. And all four of these applications are traditionally solved using specialized first order methods because we don't need two accurate solutions. However, in this, in this work, we're able to showcase that we can create specialized interior point methods that use more or less the same memory as uh, specialized first order methods and are equally or even more efficient for all of for for quite diverse set of applications. Okay, so that brings me to some numerical results to give you an idea of how uh, this method works, and most importantly, to try to convince you of the importance of using regularization in the context of interior point methods. So, the first test, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see the benefits of regularization in terms of both efficiency as well as robustness. And to do this, we compare IPPMM with a non-regularized version on the Netlib test set, which contains 96 linear programming problems. And to compare the two methods over the whole data set, we report the performance profiles with respect to time and iterations. And these are the results we obtain. Now, just to give you an idea of how to read performance profiles, the efficiency of a method is measured by how fast a line goes up with robustness measured by the maximum achievable percentage. So from the first graph, you can observe that the regularized variant is both significantly more efficient as well as more robust compared to the non-regularized variant. And the reason for the, for the, in, for the efficiency gain is the following. In, in both of these uh, algorithms, we are factorizing the Newton system. And when you're factorizing a regularized Newton system, all, uh, you can actually be very ab aggressive with, your, with the pivots during the factorization approach, which means that the resulting factorization matrices are significantly sparser compared to the factorization matrices you obtain when you have a non-regularized Newton system. So that results in efficiency gains. And also, we had a few problems that the non-regularized variant was unable to solve. 
Now, in terms of iterations, you can see that we have to incur some overhead. So the regularized variant requires more iterations to converge, but this by no means ha has any effect into its efficiency. So we can showcase the same thing for convex quadratic programming problems as well on the Maros Mezaros test set, which contains 122 convex quadratic programming instances. And in this case, we see a huge uh, improvement in terms of robustness. And there's a very good reason for this. The Maros Mezaros te uh, test set contains several ill-conditioned problems. And as you can see, the non-regularized variant actually fails due to numerical instability to solve about 25% uh, of, uh, of these problems. On the other hand, the regularized IPM solves the whole test set successfully and at the same time remains equally or even more efficient compared to the non-regularized variant. Again, the same as before, we have an overhead in terms of iterations, but this is actually benign in the sense that the method is equally or more efficient. At the same time, as I said, uh, we have to showcase that our method is scalable and it remains efficient and, and robust when we are using iterative linear algebra. And of course, we only want to use iterative linear algebra when we're dealing with large problems. So in, in this test here, we compare an IPPMM that uses factorization versus an IPPMM that uses uh, the Krill of subspace solvers preconditioned with the preconditioners I discussed earlier on 26 large scale linear programs. And again, we present the um, performance profiles. So from these uh, graphs, you can observe that the method that uses iterative linear algebra is significantly more efficient and also more robust. And I should mention here that these, pro these uh, experiments were conducted on a, on a personal computer with 16 gigabytes of RAM, and this was not sufficient to actually uh, obtain a factorization for the Newton system for some of these problems. And this is why the factorization-based approach fails to solve about 20% of this data set. This does not occur for when we're using uh, iterative linear algebra. And at the same time, we obtain significantly faster algorithm because we are not using as much memory. Now, in terms of iterations, we have a slight overhead. So we require a bit more iterations. And that's, of course, normal because we're using inexact Newton directions. But as you can observe, this is almost negligible. Now, I want to go to... Um, purely nonlinear convex optimization problem. And I should mention that our theory does not cover this case at the moment. So in this problem that we consider a, essentially a Poisson image restoration tasks, where we minimize the kullback leibler divergence of X with respect to some reference image, plus a total variation regularizer subject to some equality and inequality constraints. And this problem, as I said, corresponds to restoring images corrupted by Poisson noise. And it has several applications, including in uh, applications in computed tomography or astronomical images. Now, I should also mention that the regularization term, this uh, total variation, is used to preserve edges of the, of the image and also for smoothing flat regions. Now, this problem is traditionally solved by first order methods and in particular, the state of the art is a variant of the so-called Chambole epoch method, which is called the primal dual algorithm with line search, which was uh, proposed in this paper. So we consider three different images. And for each image, we, we run three restoration tests. So essentially, we corrupt the images with Poisson noise using either the Gaussian blur, the motion blur, or the out-of-focus blur. And to compare the quality of the obtained solution using the Chambol, the PDAL, and the specialized IPPMM, we compare the root mean square error. Of course, in this case, the smaller the better. The peak signal to noise ratio, the larger the better, of course. And another metric, which is the so called mean structural similarity, which measures the perceived similarity of the restored image to the original image. And again, in this case, the larger the better. Now, comparing uh, the experimental setup, we allow our specialized IPPMM for, to run for 20 iterations, and we run PDAL for the same amount of time. Now, 
as I said, this is a specialized IPPMM for this particular application. And we observe that PTAL is actually matrix free, meaning that PTAL does not need to invert any matrix. So to have um, a fair comparison, we also create a specialized variant of IPMM that is also matrix free. So both methods utilize the same amount of memory. And as I said, we run both methods for the same amount of time. Now, in this setup, we observe that the solutions that we obtain using IPPMM, our specialized version, are always better than the solutions obtained by PDAL. Specifically, in all nine instances, we have smaller RMSC, higher PSNR, and higher MSSIM. And you can also observe that um, the convergence profiles of both methods are quite similar. So here is just, a, just three examples where we plot the convergence profiles with respect to RMSC. And we observe a similar convergence profile with IPPMM obtaining a slightly better RMSC. However, RMSC is not the whole story. And to showcase the importance of obtaining a better quality solution, I will show you the actual restored image on the second example in which the both methods give us a solution that has very similar RMSC. So here, we have the blurry image, the image restored by IPPMM, and the image restored by PDAL. And to observe that the quality of the image restored by IPMM is better, simply look at the sky and you can see that, which is, a, is of course a flat region, and you can see it's significantly smoother compared to the sky from the image restored by PDAL. And the reason for, for that is that IPMM is much better uh, enforcing at enforcing the structure of the total variation regularizer. So that brings me uh, to open problems and future research directions. So I believe that uh, regularized interval point methods is a fruitful area that is by no means um, a, a closed topic. So specifically, one very important question that I believe pertains to non-regularized IPMs as well is the creation of new warm starting mechanisms because warm starting was... Uh, was studied during the 90s uh, from Erotra, and ever since then, it, it hasn't been challenged really, and I believe there's a lot of uh, a lot of room for improvement there. At the same time, as I discussed, we, our solvers and our numerical uh, results are mostly focused on convex quadratic programming. We have some theoretical results on uh, semi-definite programming as well, and we also delivered some specialized solvers for nonlinear convex optimization. However, a stable and general regularized IPM solver for nonlinear convex optimization is still missing. And in particular, I believe it's important to perform a comparison between predictor corrector schemes versus line search or trust region strategies in the context of Newton method, that, uh, especially in the context of uh, Newton systems appearing in IPMs. Another thing that is missing currently is a robust implementation of uh, a regularized variant for semi-definite programming problems. And related to this is an extension of the theory and this implementation to non-symmetric cones as well, which is something that uh, we haven't touched upon. Finally, and I believe this is the hardest and most um, important uh, open problem, is the creation of a robust and matrix-free implementation of uh, regularized IPM for its huge scale convex optimization. I believe this uh, has a lot of uh, significant applications, but of course it is an extremely difficult problem. Every time I try, I try to touch it, I, I always run into issues, but uh, a, a general matrix-free IPM solver would be a, a, very, a very important uh, breakthrough. So this is it for me. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Spiridon. Um, what we'll do is we'll go to the Q&A um, <clears throat> and then in the room as well if, if there's questions. So I'll start with the first one in, that's in the Q&A. So if you have questions, please put them in there and we'll get to them. Um, so the first question in there is why was interior point method selected from the three? Yes. So the reason we selected interior point methods compared to, say, um, 
a first order approach or augmented Lagrangian schemes is that interior point methods are are known to be state of the art first of all in terms of uh, convergence and uh, convergence uh, speed but they're also um, quite reliable so when running let's say um augmented Lagrangian schemes on uh, difficult, li even linear or com complex quadratic programming problems, we run into issues uh, much more easily compared to standard interior point methods. So we thought that improving upon interior point methods is, is going to be quite important, especially in practice, because commercial solvers rely on interior point methods. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, is there any questions in the room at all? Yeah, at the back, I'll repeat it if it doesn't uh, <laughs> reach it through. So, can you hear the microphone? I'll, I'll repeat it. <laughs> I don't know if it will reach. Um, there are lots of commercial solvers around now that use interior point methods. There's lots of commercial solvers now that use interior methods. Is your method now being incorporated into some of those commercial solvers? Because it seems like a big breakthrough to me. And is that method now being incorporated into those solvers? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, so, so, sorry, if, just to make sure I understood the question correctly. I, I, am I being asked whether this regularized variant is incorporating in commercial solvers? Yes. 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 So, not at the moment. Although, um, although I do have, um, we do have, I do have some correspondence with. Uh, with uh, uh, the, the the team from uh, Heis, which is um, a linear programming solver, but they are, they are using uh, non-regularized variants. But the whole idea here is to showcase the potential of regularized interior point methods, and hopefully, and hopefully, so that they they pick pick up on this. I believe, like I believe, a, a fine-tuned and good implementation of of a regularized interior point variant. Can can uh, can be significantly more uh, robust. Having said that, uh, the implementations that we provided were MATLAB-based, although quite efficient, but still MATLAB-based. But recently, there was a team, uh, I think, from EPFL <laughs> that also extended uh, our implementation to a C++ solver. So that's also something to note. Brilliant, thank you. I think there was one in the chat as well. Oh, yeah. We'll just go to the chat really. You see the one at the bottom here. Oh, yeah, that, but... that's just about. Oh, sorry. That's Karen. <laughs> <laughs> that's all that. I think we have got another Brilliant. question. Thank though. you so much, Thurden, for going into such detail about everything. And um, oh, we have one more yeah, question as well. Uh, so I'll go to this one and then I'll go back in the room as well. Uh, how efficient is the IPM for other problems such as the integer linear programming problems? Uh, well, so for, for, for integer problems, the, um, an IPM would be used for, for the subproblems, for the relaxation, right? So it, it, it depends on the integer problem. So if we're dealing with um, a linear mixed integer optimization problems, then it's, uh, it's, it's quite efficient, let's say, for linear programming or quadratic programming. And I believe that extensions for conic programming are relatively... Um, straightforward at least from the theory uh, but for general no uh, non-linear mixed integer problems uh, i am not sure to be honest because currently our implementations for non-linear convex optimization are specialized to specific applications so uh, i'm not sure about that brilliant thank you is there any other question in the room at the front, you, you should be able to hear this one. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Uh, thanks, Fredo, for the talk. I don't know if you can hear me okay. Yes. All uh, right. Uh, just one question. You mentioned that the performance of the method, the Newton method, deteriorates as you need optimal solutions, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. So you said something about it becomes increasingly more ill conditioned. Do you have any intuition as to why this happens? Uh, yes. So this relates to. Uh, if you remember from the Newton system, there's this IPM scaling matrix that appears. And uh, what happens here is that as we're approaching the solution, we're approaching, uh, we're approaching to, um, so we have the complementarity from the optimality condition. So if you have uh, the primal solution X and Z being the slack variables of the problem, we have X times Z equals zero. So essentially what happens here is that these two um, are, we obtain the complementarity from the inequality constraints, 
and these appear uh, in a form x over z. So either one of those is going to be zero and the other one is going to be non-zero. So we obtain terms that are either close to zero or uh, blow up close. Uh, so blow up in terms of magnitude. So this is why this happens. It, it, it relates to complementarity directly. Thank you. Is there any other questions from in the room? I don't think there is. So thank you so much, Spirit, and for all the presentation. It was so insightful. There's definitely probably a lot of virtual class, but <laughs> from in the room, thank you so much. Thank you as well. Thank you very much, Spirit. And um, I had a question. Did you get the opportunity to actually apply um, the algorithm on a real world use case? Uh, not at the moment, to be honest with you. I mean, we have tried on all the, all the applications we have worked on were actually with real data, so they're not... Uh, okay. Uh, but but we haven't actually had the opportunity to to see it uh, in a real setting. So that's something I would I would look forward to. Yeah. Great. No, so thanks a lot. Very insightful, as Caitlin said, and and, and thank you as well. And um, very deserving recipient of this year's doctoral award. Well done, Spirit. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank a you. Lot. So let's move on to the highlight of today's event, the Bill Lecture. We we are honored to have a, a truly distinguished speaker for, for, for this year's lecture, as Professor Chris Potts. Um was a Bill Medal winner for 2021. And that was for recognizing um a sustained contribution over many years to the theory practice and, and philosophy of OR in the UK. And over his career, Chris has been an author or co-author of over 100 papers that have been published in high quality journals. Um, he has also been active in the promotion of OR and has notably served as a chair of the Southern OR Group, a vice president of the Association of European OR societies, and was part of a, a team that created a national um, thought course center for, for operational research that has provided training for doctoral students. Um, Chris's presentation is titled Reflections on Half a Century of Research in OR, and um, he will present some of the research um, highlights of his, of his OR career, which started in 1971 when he started a PhD at the University of Birmingham on branch and bound algorithms for production scheduling problems. His work on scheduling continues whilst working as a lecturer in, in mathematics at the University of Kiel. And in 1985, he was appointed a lecturer and later professor in operational research at the University of Southampton. This broadened his research interests and he has worked on OR applied in sports, healthcare, transport, logistics, to name a few. He's current, currently an emeritus professor at the um, University of Southampton. Please join me in welcoming Professor Chris Potts, our speaker for this year's Bill Lecture. Over to you, Chris. Uh, thank you for the nice uh, introduction, Gilbert. Um, the first part of my talk, uh, I was going to give a bit of background anyway, so uh, you said most of these things, but I'll uh, show, show the slides anyway. So uh, I started off um, my uh, higher education by um, doing a BSc in mathematics at the uh, University of Manchester. <coughs> As part of that uh, BSc, um, we actually did a course on linear programming, and uh, I enjoyed that. And then I uh, found out that it was related to uh, OR, so I thought, well, I'll go and do an MSc in OR. And I ended up at the University of Hull, and I um, enjoyed the um, study at Hull, so I thought I'd continue my education and uh, go on and do a PhD. And, um, 
Oh, I remember now how, how I uh, ended up choosing the um, University of Birmingham. But uh, one thing about Birmingham was that um, they had um, three previous um, PhDs in the area of scheduling. So uh, it was sort of very natural that I would continue that trend, that trend uh, to um, scheduling, machine scheduling for uh, my PhD. And um, after the PhD, um, I um, started off with a lectureship at the University of Kiel, where I stayed for about um, 12 years. But um, I was a little bit isolated at Kiel, because um, I was the only person there working in uh, operational research. So um, when I saw a job at the University of Southampton uh, advertised, and I knew they had to a significant size of OR group, I decided I would apply for that. I was fortunate enough to uh, get um, the job. And um, then um, I went through the ranks, really. I started off as lecturer, then moved to senior lecturer, then reader, and then in 2000 uh, I became a professor. And that lasted until I uh, 2022 when I retired, and um, since 2022 I've been a um, emeritus uh, professor. Yeah. It's almost, yeah, it's <laughs> it um, I'd like it done some more. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to start off my talk um, quite naturally, I think, by um, uh, talking about um, scheduling. These are uh, just some of the areas I worked on. So my early, early um, part of my career, including my PhD studies, were designing uh, plants and bound algorithms to find the uh, exact solutions for uh, a variety of scheduling problems. Um, I did some work on um, design of heuristics and um, um, Sorry. Um, deriving uh, performance bounds. So, uh, in terms of performance bounds, you try to look and say that this heuristic will always get you to within 30% of the optimum, you would say, and uh, deriving uh, results of um, that form. Well, is that uh, necessarily a useful thing to do? Um, in practical terms, probably, well, in practical terms, it does actually. Because um, once you actually find the um, instance where the heuristic works badly, you not only sit up and see what's going on, you change the heuristic to uh, make sure that it caters for these uh, difficult uh, situations. So I think uh, doing the worst case analysis of heuristics is a worthwhile um, um, research topic. Um, over time, of course, new types of scheduling problems are um, being uh, proposed in the literature. And um, when a new type of problem comes along, the uh, uh, complexity of it um, um, is interesting. So what we mean by complexity is, can we solve this problem to optimality efficiently? Or does it belong to this um, um, wide class of classes like the travel sales <laughs> problem? For which um, they're all equivalent in the worst case. If you could find a polynomial time algorithm for one, you could find a polynomial time algorithm for, uh, for all of them. So, of course, the general conjecture is that you know, if you prove this problem is hard, then it, it really is hard, and it doesn't exist a polynomial time algorithm. Um, I looked at some online um, problems. Um, so an online problem is when the uh, information about the problem arrives to you over time. So for example, if you're uh, putting um, patients into um, a hospital for surgery, then um, you, you, have, you, you have a problem. You, there's no such thing as an optimal solution for an online problem because you don't have all the information at the outset to um, um, create an optimal solution. You may, you may uh, uh, make a decision about the uh, next patient that was arriving, and uh, um, you look at it in the, with the current information you've got available, but you may uh, schedule that in the wrong place and prevent uh, 
difficulties later on when future um, um, people arrive. So, um, yeah, so it's, a, so it's, a, it's an interesting problem, this. And uh, people try and do um, competitive analysis for us and see how the uh, quality of the solution that you get by your online algorithm compares with the quality of the solution you would get if you had all the information available at time zero and uh, we could create an optimal solution. And, um, yeah, of course, in the um, um, 80s and 90s, the um, use of meta heuristics uh, or uh, local search heuristics uh, became very important, you know, methods like um, simulating simulation in to do search, um, genetic algorithms. And um, uh, all sorts of uh, strange variants of um, um, algorithm um, appeared, and um, these actually gave give you very good solutions to uh, many uh, hard scheduling uh, problems. So um, I did quite a bit of work on that area. And I'll just describe one of the things I um, did in more detail later on. Okay, I'm going to talk about the diversity of um, um, machine scheduling problems. I'm actually going to um, describe to you 448 um, scheduling problems in uh, uh, two or three slides. Okay, so we actually um, have a shorthand notation to represent um, scheduling problems of this form uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. So the uh, first field, alpha, is uh, tells you about the uh, machines that are available in the problem. Beta tells you about the uh, about the jobs and what constraints there are on um, that you have to satisfy. And um, gamma is the uh, objective function, which uh, depends on uh, what particular problem we're working on. So. Um, I'll describe uh, alpha, beta, and gamma in more detail now. So um, it's traditional that uh, for any scheduling problem, m is the number of machines and n is the number of jobs. Of course, uh, m may be as small as one, but um, um, you normally have a, uh, a good collection of jobs. Well, And uh, standard constraints on the uh, problems that you have. Uh, the main thing is that the uh, machine can only do one job at a time. Uh, exceptions to that in three, but uh, most problems that is the uh, that is the case. And uh, the job can only uh, be in one place at a time. So you can't simultaneously process it on uh, more than uh, one machine at the same time instance. So I'm going to show you now what makes up uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. So alpha is equal to one, means you just have uh, one machine. These, these uh, first four problem, um, choices for alpha um, are all problems where there's um, just one operation on the job uh, to be done. So alpha equals p means you've got um, identical parallel machines, to, uh, and uh, it doesn't matter what uh, machine you process the uh, Job on, so you you're buying uh, identical uh, copies of the same machine just to uh, um, speed things up in comparison with uh, the case if you had uh, one machine. If alpha equals q, then these are uniform parallel machines, which essentially they're uh, the same, but they have different speeds. So if it's uh, got a machine speed of two you would just um, divide the uh, standard um, processing time by two to get the processing time on the uh, faster machine. And uh, if alpha is equal to R, 
then the uh, processing time of the job just depends on the job itself and the machine on which you process process it on. So there may be um, some machines that where the job is not very uh, efficiently processed, and that in that case, processing time will be uh, large. Okay, and uh, the ones at the bottom, um, well, now it's S, O, and J, um, are problems where you have multiple operations on, uh, for example, on different machines. Um, F is a flow shop, um, which means that every job is first processed on machine one, then it moves on to machine two, then it moves on to machine three, etc. If alpha is equal to O, that's an open shop, and it means that the operations can um, be done on the different machines, can be done on in uh, any order. For example, if you're um, having your car serviced, it doesn't really matter whether you um, have the uh, work on the tires done first or the work on the headlights. And they're completely independent of each other, and you could uh, decide which order you wanted to do those uh, two things. And for alpha is equal to J, then uh, each job is very much a customized job um, for a customer. And, uh, um, the class, and, you know, based on the nature of the job, it will pass through different machines in, uh, in different orders. So um, the job shop is the most general of these uh, types of scheduling problems. So I want to talk uh, um, about the uh, constraints on the jobs now. Um, if B2 is empty, that second field, it means that there's no additional constraints on the jobs and uh, you've got nothing else to worry about. Um, RJ, each job has a release date RJ, so that's the first uh, uh, occasion that uh, you can um, process it on the machine. Some jobs have deadlines, which I think are called DJ bar, which is the uh, latest time that the job can finish. You might say, why do I call it DJ bar? Because and the reason is that we have uh, um, a DJ, which means something else, as you'll see on the uh, next slide. So the DJ bar is a hard constraint, and the DJ is used in a soft constraint. Um, special things about jobs. Um, some jobs have personal constraints, and you have to say that um, job J is always processed before job K. Sometimes you have preemption, which is allowed, which means you can do a bit of processing uh, on, a, uh, on a job, and uh, then you can stop it, do something else on that machine, and then resume the processing uh, later on, maybe even on a different machine. So uh, that's what we mean by preemption. So preemption generally means problems easier. Okay, we move on to the uh, objective summit functions now over. Um, gamma. Okay, we define um, due days and wait for a job. So um, they will uh, impact on the objective function. For any schedule C, uh, for any schedule, we've got a completion time of uh, job J, which we denote by uh, CJ. Then uh, we have a latest measure, which is uh, CJ minus DJ. So Note that LJ can take positive and negative values depending on whether um, CJ is less than DJ or greater than. So, to avoid penalties for uh, jobs completing early, we actually define a tardiness measure, which is uh, um, CJ minus DJ if the job is completed after its due date, or zero if it's uh, otherwise. And we also have UJ, which is zero one indicator indicating. Uh, whether the job is late or not. Okay, so the potential uh, objective functions that are normally considered. Um, the maximum completion time is an obvious one. You want to get all the work done as quickly as possible. Um, you want to um, avoid uh, one customer being particularly upset by having a large um, lateness, so you try and make the um, maximum lateness as small as possible. Um, 
Okay, so, some completion times is uh, um, another data crunch. We want to uh, um, make all of the uh, customers uh, have their job completed as soon as possible. You may want to minimize the sum of the tardiness values. Um, another um, measure of uh, customer service. Or you might just be interested in minimizing the uh, number of uh, late jobs. And uh, those last three summation measures have weighted uh, versions if uh, some jobs are more important to, uh, to others. Okay, and uh, the bit that you can't see in the um, uh, bottom of the slide is, is if you take all the um, possible combinations of them um, out of beta and gamma that I've shown to you, you will actually come up with uh, 448 uh, different problems, which is what I mentioned earlier on. Okay, then, so I'm going to talk to you about one um, branch and bound uh, algorithm that um, I designed for this particular problem. So, single machine, you've got deadlines on the jobs, and you want to minimize some of the uh, weighted completion times. Okay, this is a hard problem, and it's made hard by the deadlines. Let me show that if you don't have the deadlines, it's a trivial problem to solve. Okay, it was first solved by Smith in one of the very heavily scheduling papers in uh, um, 1956. And the argument that's used to um, derive the rule for scheduling the jobs is an uh, adjacent job interchange. So basically, you take uh, two schedules, um, a, a pair of jobs are just interchanged. So um, in this case, they're jobs uh, I and J, and Sigma is just a, um, a, a list of jobs which um, comes at the beginning of schedule, and Sigma prime are jobs that come at the end of the um, uh, schedule. But um, interchanging jobs I and J doesn't affect what ha uh, happens to the sigma and sigma prime. It doesn't affect their completion time. So uh, they're kind of uh, irrelevant in the um, um, analysis. And um, T is the time that um, the first of these jobs, uh, I and J, actually starts. OK, so I'm going to work out the um, objective function value for S minus the objective function value for um, S prime. So as I said, the, the sigma and sigma prime components don't um, count, so they cancel each other out in this uh, calculation. So um, the first um, two side, the first two terms on the right-hand side, the first uh, term, T plus PI, is the completion time of job I, is multiplied by its weight, and T plus PI plus PJ is the completion time of uh, job J, and that's multiplied by its weight. And uh, you're subtracting from that the corresponding um, values for the um, sequence uh, S prime. And if you notice uh, in this equation, a lot of the uh, terms uh, cancel out. All the terms in, in Bob and T cancel out, and WIPI and WJPJ uh, cancel out, you're just left with um, um, the simple equation at the bottom, WJPI minus WIPJ. Okay then, so if you want, you can easily now work out a condition that uh, S is better than uh, S prime. If you want the uh, value of this to be less than or equal to, to uh, zero. Oops. Okay, so if, if, you, if, you, if you set that to be less than or equal to zero, then you find out that uh, drop by sequence for J, if uh, um, the ratio of P, PI divided by WI is less than PJ divided by WJ. So a nice index here for every job, uh, P divided by W. You just sequence them in um, increasing order or non decreasing order, and that's an optimal sequence for this problem. Okay, well, of course, it doesn't work when you've got um, deadlines in place. Okay, so I'm going to uh, describe um, an algorithm that I designed with uh, Ruth and Um 
we compute lower bounds using a Roger relaxation uh, technique. And um, the uh, method actually uses a, a clever method of finding what the Lagrange multipliers uh, are. Okay then, so, the, so this is the uh, formulation of the problem. Minimize the sum of weighted completion times. Um, each um, CJ is less than or equal to deadline DJ bar. And just got machine capacity constraints that the machine only does uh, one thing at a time. We don't need to uh, write them down explicitly in the uh, problem formulation. So, what we're going to do, in fact, is to uh, actually incorporate these deadline constraints mm -hmm. into the objective function. That's what um, the Roger relaxation does. Okay, so for each of these. Um, um, uh, and constraints, we um, have a Lagrange multiple, Lagrange multiply lambda j um, for uh, each job j. Okay then, so basically this is the uh, equation that uh, you um, end up with, um, you want to minimize where you uh, put the constraints into the objective function, and now the constraints on the problem are just the machine you know, capacity constraints. It's not too difficult to see that this is going to be a lower bound. If you take the optimal values of C and an optimal solution of the uh, original problem, then the uh, summation in this uh, equation is uh, going to be the optimal objective function value. But the second term is um, going to be zero or negative because all the CJs uh, a less than or equal to DJ bar, because it's a feasible, it's an optimal solution, it's a feasible solution, so uh, the second term can't give you uh, a positive uh, value. So it's definitely uh, a lower bound. And here I've just uh, written down the um, uh, minimization in a, in a different way. Okay, I've uh, combined the uh, two terms with uh, CJ in them. And uh, that's what you get. Okay, so notice that uh, the um, you have already worked out what values of lambda you're going to use. So that uh, term at the end, the lambda j dj term, is um, going to be independent of the schedule. So uh, that's just a constant. So basically, what you've got is the coefficient of cj now, and just wj plus lambda j. So you actually just change the weight by increasing it from WJ to um, um, WJ plus lambda J. So it's easy to um, um, see how to solve this laboratory problem. You just sequence the jobs in the increasing order of um, PJ divided by WJ plus lambda J. Okay then, so the uh, gap is how do you actually um, find the values of the uh, lambdas, which values do you choose? Okay, this is a method that's uh, traditionally been used in the literature, which is known as uh, subgradient optimization. Um, so you start with any um, vector of uh, non negative values of uh, lambda. Um, you Work out your uh, lower bound. Okay, um, if um, CJ is bigger than the uh, deadline, then it means that lambda is too small. So you increase lambda. If CJ is less than the deadline, then uh, um, you can decrease lambda. It's best uh, in terms of the lower bound if the lambda is as small as uh, possible. But you have to do multiple iterations in order for uh, this to find the best multipliers. So uh, it's computationally not very exciting. So this is uh, what we um, do instead. Um, we use what we call a multiplier adjustment method. Um, we use a heuristic, heuristic to uh, sequence the jobs. And so our heuristic is just sequence the jobs in uh, the order one up to uh, n. So what we want to do is to choose the multipliers so this um, 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 sequence is the one that we will get by uh, minimizing L. 
So in other words, what, what we want to do is to um, alter the jobs um, in uh, increasing order of PJ divided by WJ plus lambda J. And uh, we can actually uh, actually solve this uh, quite easily, but we want to choose the lambda as small as possible, subject to these uh, inequality constraints. So it's very easy to uh, determine what mm -hmm. the uh, best values of the multipliers are. Oops. Okay, and uh, um, down the uh, bottom there, I've uh, sort of written a reference to the uh, paper. But the picture there is a picture of um, Duke van Bassenhoven, who actually uh, won the uh, Euro Gold Medal in uh, 2006. And uh, so this was a paper that was published in the uh, European Journal of uh, OR. And this is the environment we were working on. So I remember spending uh, hundreds of hours sitting in these um, 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 machines actually producing uh, punch cards. So then you submitted your job for, um, for being run on the mainframe of uh, a computer. Um, and typically, you, you just got one run of your jobs uh, in one day. If you were lucky, you may, may hit two in a day. And if you make a mistake on one of these punched cards, then you uh, probably get a compilation error and you won't get anything useful at all. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a tedious job. And uh, also, the memory was very uh, limited in computers those days. So you had to do. Uh, Things in a sort of slightly different way to what we would do now. Um, you would have to uh, um, design the search of your branch and bound search tree so that uh, um, you could uh, eliminate a lot of the nodes and you search them, and then you can uh, use the uh, space that you've created by discarding those nodes to uh, continue to generate new nodes and uh, keep the uh, uh, size of the boat. Um, Branch of mouse, so it's true, people are and storing under control. But nevertheless, he solved uh, reasonable size problems uh, for those days, and uh, it was a successful algorithm. <coughs> oh, no. Okay, yeah, I looked at uh, problem RC maps. Remember, this is unrelated um, parallel machines. And I came up with the heuristic that, um, yeah, um, where the heuristic value is never more than twice the uh, optimal uh, value. I'll um, briefly tell you how I uh, um, did this with uh, linear programming. So the problem's got n jobs, n machines. To process job j on machine i, the person time is uh, pij. Our heuristic. Um, H, um, first step of it is to solve the linear um, programming relaxation of the uh, formulation of the problem. So uh, Sij are assignment variables. So uh, Sij is one if you uh, assign job J to machine I, zero or uh, otherwise. And Cmax, of course, is the um, maximum uh, completion time for the problem. Oh, that's, yeah. Okay, so this is the uh, formulation of the problem. Um, what the first constraint is doing is just summing up the processing times um, of all the jobs on machine I. Okay, and uh, the CMAX value must be uh, uh, at least as big as some of those uh, processing times. Second constraint is easy, it just tells you that uh, every job trade is supposed to be uh, um, assigned to one of the machines. And the constraint at the bottom you can't see is just saying that uh, the SIJ is 0, 1 uh, variables. I'll bring this up again there, but we're going to uh, be talking about it. Okay, so the uh, key thing here is actually uh, 
working looking at the basic variables in this in the linear um, programming relaxation to this problem. So rather than have the zero one constraints at the bottom, you just say that the xijs of grace than or equal to zero. They should they can't be bigger than one anyway because the um, the second constraint uh, ensures that that's the case. Okay, so we know that Cmax is um, basic. Okay, so the um, from the um, second constraint, we know that uh, each um, job has got to be assigned to some machine. So there's uh, n constraints there. Every constraint's going to have a basic variable uh, in it. Okay, and um, of course uh, the uh, n, n uh, constraints for the uh, c for the c mass constraint, the first constraint. Um, it's got a basic variable in it. Okay, so we know that um, set of constraints uh, gives you uh, n, n uh, Okay, so the num number of um, constraints is um, n, n plus n, so uh, we've got n plus n basic variables. Um, one of the basic variables is um, C match, because that, that's going to be positive. Um, and we know that um, in each of the uh, assignment constraints, the second constraints, each job J, each constraint for J is uh, got a basic variable in it. So there's a few uh, N variables. So you've got um, N, N plus one that you know about, and there's another. Um, N minus, N minus one that uh, you don't uh, that, uh, you don't know which uh, constraints they belong to. Okay then, so these uh, N, these uh, other N minus one constraints, um, the worst thing that can happen in the surety is they belong to the assignment constraints. Okay, so. Um, that means that uh, n subtracting uh, m n minus one um, um, means that uh, these variables all contain uh, that, uh, other, that these uh, um, constraints have just got one basic variable in, and uh, those x values are uh, equal to one. So a lot of a lot of the x values are equal to one when you solve this uh, linear programming. Uh, Relaxation. So, in fact, you've only got um, n, n minus one of these uh, assignment constraints where you've got uh, fractional values in. Okay, well, so we're, we're really thinking about uh, problems where n is uh, relatively small, you know, maybe we're about five uh, machines, but uh, n may, you know, you may have 50 jobs. So, uh, n is usually much bigger than uh, m. Okay, so this is our heuristic. When uh, x i j is equal to one in that linear program immunization, you made that uh, assignment in your heuristic. And then you've got these uh, other uh, m minus one jobs, which have got uh, fractional uh, values. So you just, um, uh, because m is relatively small, you just made uh, uh, two um, computing information to find out where their uh, best positions are. So we're pretty much done now. Okay, then, so um, we've got uh, there's an optimal schedule, C max star, it's the heuristic schedule, the like, heuristic I just described. Okay, so um, in, uh, in the assignment um, part of it, with all those um, x's which are equal to 1, um, clearly um, they will um, build some this C max value that you're working with is minimized, um, then that's going to be an optimal. Um, the main span for that part of the uh, schedule is going to be less than or equal to. Uh, the optimal CMAX star. And because you're um, doing the second uh, step, the completing enumeration step, um, so this is another uh, 
Stephen John, but um, what they contributing to the uh, overall CMAX value um, is less than CMAX star as well, because of the complete enumeration aspect. So if you combine these uh, two um, things, then you um, uh, get um, CMAX star plus one, and CMAX star plus two, and you get uh, two CMAX. Sorry, I missed, I missed out the uh, start from that last uh, inequality. So this was uh, a paper that uh, I published in the uh, Sweet Mathematics in uh, 1985. Okay, so one, one last thing in this problem I'm going to uh, talk about. This is a single machine problem to minimize the sum of uh, weighted charges. So uh, the work I'm um, describing um, was uh, um, due to Richard Holgram, who was a PhD student at the time, and this was part of his thesis, and um, State Van der Velde, who works at um, Rasmus University of Rotterdam. Okay, so normally when you're applying um, local search, um, what you do is to look at a sequence of jobs, and um, work out what interchange you're going to make. Um, that uh, improves the sequence, you make that interchange, and that's the end of the iteration. And you keep repeating that procedure. But so uh, what we thought we'd do is to try and do something better. We thought we'd try and do uh, multiple swaps in the same uh, iteration. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do, how to do it. Okay, and so I suppose we've got uh, the sequence one up to uh, ten. So um, the types of sorts that we're trying to do um, are um, swapping two with five, for example, and nine with uh, seven. Okay, so that's one of the uh, um, pairs of swaps that uh, we're going to um, uh, try and make. And they're independent because the uh, two and the five both appear to the, uh, the four, the nine and the seven. Okay, so that's the uh, condition that this is going to work. So the, um, the second of the um, swaps can't interfere with what you've done previously with the uh, first of the, uh, of the swaps. So this is one. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that um, if you swap two with five and you would swap four with nine, then that wouldn't be independent because four is in the middle of this. Uh, uh, block containing um, two, three, and four prime. You're not allowed to uh, um, to change that. Okay, then. So this is uh, the uh, the kind of, um, part of it. Um, um, the method that we call is that we uh, propose is called Dyne search. There's a combination of um, um, dynamic programming, which we use, and uh, and local search. Okay, the so current sequence we assume it's uh, uh, one up to n. So let c i and j be uh, um, total weighted tiredness that we get if we um, um, take the block of jobs i plus one up to j and. Uh, we do a swap on the, on the uh, ends of them. So the, uh, that block now starts with J and the uh, I plus one is at the end. Okay, and um, it doesn't affect what's happening to blocks that come before this one or blocks that come after this one. So what we can do, um, so F, capital F is the uh, total weighted time for jobs and F of J is looking at the first J jobs, uh, and that's after applying independent swaps. And this is uh, a, a recursive equation saying how we would get to uh, F of J. We would have uh, some previous set of blocks going up to job I at the beginning, and then the CIJ would be um, the uh, uh, what we get by looking at the uh, um, jobs like plus one up to uh, up to J. I should add that um, if this um, um, swap of I plus one and J um, results in something that is worse, 
then you keep the original value, value and you don't actually uh, interchange your uh, I plus one to, uh, to J. So this uh, dynamic um, program can be solved uh, efficiently. And um, the nice thing about it is that the uh, number of potential um, new solutions that we've looked at is um, 2 to the power uh, n minus 1. So basically, every job is a uh, candidate for being uh, the beginning or the end of one of these blocks and, uh, and being, uh, being swapped. So every job has got a, um, a sort of zero or um, one indicator attached to it, just to whether it's part of, part of the uh, um, um, part of the block and swap the creating process. It's two to the n minus one because you've got to have uh, an even number of jobs for the swap. So once you get to uh, n, either you've got to include it because you've already got a number, or um, you don't include it because uh, um, you've already got an even number of uh, swaps. So it did actually work pretty well in uh, in practice. That's the uh, that's the reference. It was a work published in the Informers uh, Journal of Computing. So, um, anyway, it was nice to know that I'd uh, introduced a new word dinosaur into the English language. Move on to some more now I in the uh, area of um, transportation. Um, the reason, well, one of the reasons why I got uh, uh, interested in this was that. Uh, we were um, part of the um, team that um, uh, was in the uh, Lance Initiative, and um, basically um, one of the uh, research clusters within that was um, uh, transport and logistics. And I was the um, joint leader of the transport and this uh, research cluster on transport and logistics. So, uh, I thought I'd better be doing some work on transport to um, earn my money. So um, we go to, to train threatening problems. So uh, um, Banish Banish Kosrabi was a um, PhD student at the uh, at the time. He's now got a job at the uh, University of Portsmouth. Judy Bennell has left uh, Southampton now. He's uh, working at the University of Leeds. And, uh, I used to, to jump into. So we um, looked at uh, train scheduling. Now, train, train scheduling is really like a, um, a job shop. So the um, stretches of track are like machines, and, um, and you only want one uh, train at a time on that stretch of track. And the different trains are uh, other jobs. And uh, <coughs> we went to the um, Drop shop scheduling and literature and adapted some of the uh, um, algorithms that were available to the, uh, to the rail industry. So, another um, um, piece of work was on airport runway uh, scheduling. This was also, also with uh, Julia Bennell, uh, PhD student, Mohammed uh, Mr. Paul, and myself. So, we were looking at the scheduling of um, landing. An aircraft on a single runway. And again, you can see that that's really going to be the um, um, single machine shaking from the runway is the machine, and the uh, aircraft to be landed and uh, um, the jobs. Um, the interesting uh, thing about the uh, problem is that uh, the space that you have to leave between uh, Landing aircraft depends on the size of the uh, aircraft because uh, aircraft leave a lot of turbulence when they're um, traveling through the sky. The separation times um, are 72 when you've got a big aircraft followed by a small aircraft, 22 seconds, and they're 169 if those two aircraft are the other way around. The lighter aircraft land first and the heavy ones um, second. So what you would uh, ideally like to do is to batch the um, light aircrafts and uh, then in one after the other, and also batch the uh, um, um, 
Heb jij gehad, dat is wel een persoon die we niet zien. In this particular um, study, we uh, had a time window, um, which says the uh, time that the uh, aircraft should land. And uh, we looked at both the online problem and offline problem. So online problem, you only have uh, information about the next few, few, few uh, flights that are coming in, and uh, um, you only get uh, um, information about later flights um, <coughs> later on in time. Anyway, this was um, the work that uh, we published. It was published in the European uh, um, Journal of Operational Research. A um, couple of pictures are uh, Julia Bennett and the PhD student uh, I have made this report. Okay, then, so let's move on to uh, something completely different. <laughs> you probably had enough. Uh, now, I'm not going to take you through all 448 scheduling uh, problems. Um, so, researching sports. So, uh, we did quite a lot of work in uh, Formula One in the uh, 1990s. It all uh, arose to uh, an MSc student that um, I had, and he was uh, interested in um, sports. And um, he actually contacted me and uh, suggested that it would be nice to actually do um, a sport in uh, Formula One motor racing. So um, we actually wrote a letter to uh, McLaren. We also uh, wrote a letter to Williams as well, but they never replied to us. But um, McLaren actually invited us to their headquarters in Morgan to uh, actually have a discussion about the uh, possible MSC project. So we did it uh, way on um, a project on uh, race strategy. So um, basically, the problem is to decide when um, cars should be made uh, pit stops, tire changes, and uh, at that point in time, uh, refueling was done at pit stops as well. But we did it just for a single car. We were just looking at how uh, we can get the uh, um, down the car around the uh, circuit as quickly as uh, possible uh, in all the other cars. And they had plenty of uh, data available for us uh, to use. Well, the, the rest of it was on paper. I mean, to assume that to convert it into uh, electronic form. So there's only going to be a small number of uh, big stop in this race, two, um, one, two, or three normally. So you could actually do a complete enumeration of that you're going to do the uh, pit stops on. And um, um, that, that would solve the problem. But uh, to make it more of an OR um, type um, MSC project, um, we actually did it with dynamic programming, which uh, Second program, which was uh, much uh, faster. Okay, we actually continued to um, um, work uh, with uh, with McLaren. We had another uh, student, uh, Mark Ainsworth, who you may have heard of from the the Art Society. I think we they were lecture for you uh, recently. Um, so um, he was he was also a student on our uh, MSc program but, that uh, um, worked on um, working with McLaren. He was later employed as a research research associate, uh, um, funded by McLaren to actually write a simulation of um, the Formula One race, and uh, that really picked up the interaction between the cars and you're getting a real real life race. It's important to have a simulation because, uh, you know, um, the, um, McLaren wants to ask, uh, answer the question. So if there's a um, safety car that comes out in the race the next lap, is it the best thing for us to start and do a pit stop, which is a cheap um, pit stop, but take the car out, or do we go on and uh, not take advantage of that cheap uh, pit stop? So that's what the uh, simulation does to uh, evaluate these uh, possibilities.
George Slater, the original um, student at uh, Neil Martin, is quite interesting. Um, he was employed by um, McLaren and worked there for several years. Then he got a job for, um, he went on to Red Bull and worked with them. And uh, then uh, after that, he moved to Ferrari and worked in uh, initially with, uh, with them. And uh, it was a nice story once. Uh, he, his, his father actually got ill. He was um, well, living in uh, Cornwall, and uh, um, um, Ferrari said, well, okay, yeah, you can uh, uh, use our private jet, basically, back, back to Cornwall, for um, Cornwall, because he was a farm man. But um, this was really the start of um, uh, Formula One, uh, one racing, employing um, race strategists. But before uh, our uh, MSC project, it, it wasn't really done. It wasn't really <coughs> seen as uh, um, no, no one would thought of it as a role, I think, within motor racing. And uh, in fact, um, half of the um, uh, motor racing teams at the moment actually use some version of the software that uh, Neil, Neil Martin uh, uh, ended up. Uh, um, Using from the cloud, not the MSC stuff, but more enhanced versions of it. Okay, then, so uh, last thing I was going to talk about is a bit of work I did on uh, dolls. So, um, it was to do with the uh, FedEx car. So, um, in the um, PGA Tour in the United States, they play tournaments throughout the year, and then the uh, players towards the top, of the top of the rankings actually play had the uh, had this um, FedEx Cup playoff, which consists of three events and finishes with the uh, 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 event called the uh, Tour Championship. Okay, so um, this, this is how it works. The um, um, top 125 players compete in the first two of these um, three events. And then the top 30 players from the um, um, from the two events compete in the final events. Um, it's a complicated point system where they um, change the points so that uh, one of the top four um, and players are going to win the uh, FedEx Cup if they if they win this final event, the Tour Championship. And the reason uh, why they won that is they don't want to end up with something like this. Okay, so this was a previous uh, situation in 2009 where um, um, Bill Mickelson won the uh, Tour Championship, the last of these um, mm -hmm. Uh, event in this uh, playoffs, but he didn't win the FedEx FedEx Cup because the title was got more uh, points than him, even if they didn't win the final event. So they're both, both collecting the trophies, but uh, it's not clear who's uh, the uh, overall winner of this final event. Okay, so um, with uh, my colleague um, Nick Hall from uh, Ohio State University. Um, we uh, designed an alternative uh, um, tour event to the one that they had in the uh, the moment. So in our um, proposed uh, event, the, um, we would just select the top uh, 28 players who would uh, play, and uh, let the current rankings um, um, let, let players be um, this is according to the current rankings. So we've got first rank. Second round, third round, round etc., down to uh, 28. So, this is the design of the tournament that um, um, we would have. So, um, in round one, it's only the um, bottom eight players um, that are um, playing in the, um, in the first round. Okay, so we have the uh, R21 plays R28, the highest against the lowest, and then the next one, um, 22 is the highest rank of all of these, and they play against this, uh, the second lowest, etc. So we have um, 
um, four, four of these uh, matches. Um, the losers of those matches get eliminated, so they're out of it. And then, uh, and then we have uh, four winners that go through to uh, round two. And then the next group of um, four players come into it. So um, they play the um, um, next lot. So the four winners play the next lot of players, ranked uh, 17 to 20. And this process continues. So uh, four uh, players get eliminated and four new ones come into the, uh, to the tournament. <coughs> Until uh, eventually, um, in round six, we get the top four players actually uh, actually coming in, and they play the uh, um, previous winners from uh, round five. And um, in round seven, um, the um, highest uh, rank winner plays the lowest rank winner, winner, and then two others play each other. <coughs> and then from the four uh, that remain. We have a, uh, a final and a third place match. So, as you might imagine, the um, you know um, players that um, actually uh, come in round one have a pretty low chance of actually winning because uh, they've got to go through uh, eight rounds in order to uh, actually win the competition. So, um, the quite a lot of waiting is given to uh, what the current uh, rankings are. Uh, next slide gives um, um, some uh, probabilities. So uh, these are the R1 to R5, the ranking of the, of the uh, players, and these um, numbers of percentage probabilities that then um, brings you first, second, third, fourth, or fifth. There's a lot, there's, there may be several players um, tied for fifth place, but they all get eliminated at the same stage, and uh, they're not involved in any um, further matches. But uh, mm. you, can, you can see that the top round player, you know, does uh, um, stand with uh, chance of entering uh, high up. Okay, so um, there's some. Uh, Statistics that are uh, computed from the table uh, indicating how um, based on different rankings, how often they would uh, be bring the tournament. So if you're in the top eight, then uh, you stand a, a fair chance. The uh, probability of winning goes um, down. And um, okay, so this is uh, uh, Nicole. We, we published this paper in uh, Interfaces, and uh, Nick was actually the um, president of uh, Informs between 2017 and 2019. Okay, so my uh, um, final thoughts. Well, I hope I've uh, given you a good um, overview of some of the research I've done, uh, scheduling and, uh, and sport. Uh, and, uh, done a little bit of work in uh, healthcare as well. And um, I must say that um, throughout my career, I've, I've enjoyed the variety of different uh, problems that um, <coughs> OR can be uh, applied, applied to. And even though I'm now uh, retired, I'm still working on some. Uh, Projects. I was uh, up in Liverpool visiting Tolkien on a research meeting uh, in January, so uh, I uh, hadn't uh, lost motivation to do research. I that will continue for a few years. So that's what I wanted to say. So uh, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you. <laughs> We'll just go to the Q&A and then we'll go in the room for a few questions. So we've just got the one at the moment. Okay, so the question is, would this only cover scheduling problems? I thought it would cover the entire history of OR. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Where was that sent? I think that was a yeah. drum, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which oh, yeah. I think I think yeah. I think 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 I think
Yeah, I am. Um, I definitely think it was earlier on. <laughs> Hopefully now it's uh, it's got a bit more in depth. Yeah. So, is there any questions in the room at all? Well, I'm making an observation, John. Um, years ago, and this is apropos of your work on the, the aircraft. You know, I was driving on the M40 near Heathrow. As I would drive one way, I can see a stack of planes coming down. And you thought these are close together. Now you've just given away the sort of timings that you were working on to keep those separations. But by God, it's impressive when you see it. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I did. Uh, Probably not one to be flying around uh, over the aircraft in the, the stack, but um, um, sometimes it's um, uh, unavoidable the disruption. It would be better to take them on a sort of longer route to reach the uh, aircraft, to reach the uh, um, airport. Hmm. Hmm. Is there any other questions at all? Yeah, at the top. Chris, with the golf example, I was wondering what the players thought of that new way of doing it. Because I totally see how it makes it interesting for the crowd and the organisers, but the players have a very unclear, until you know, until each match has happened, they don't know when they're going to be playing or, or, or whatever. Yeah, but they, do, they do. I mean, they do have um, mm. um, match play events on them. PGA Tour, mm -hmm. so uh, they uh, are somewhat familiar with them. Um, I don't know, I don't know really. The top players who were uh, entirely probably in high shed, and the ones that I doubt probably wouldn't like it so much. But uh, no, it was, ne it was never it was never used. I think we, uh, I think my uh, colleague, uh, Nick Horn, did actually um, discuss it uh, with the PGA. Um, I think they've uh, already decided on um, on the route. And uh, it is you, you're, you're right in thinking that the players in uh, the US have uh, quite a lot of power when it's done. Yeah, we did. We did actually um, do another study, which I didn't talk about today, where um, we looked at the um, how they, about how they should uh, decide on making the cuts, how many players they should eliminate after the uh, after the second round and the third round. And, uh, we actually did quite a nice analysis of that. We ne ne never really published. Um, um, we, um, we sent it to um, an R journal and they said there wasn't enough that R in it to justify publication. But, uh, but, but for that, they, um, they did, they paid quite a lot of attention, I think, in GM. Quite a few long phone um, calls to me all. Uh, I think we're very in Swanson. Any other questions? Hmm. No? Okay, well, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you to Spiridon as well. Um, and I'll pass back over to Gilbert. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, actually, uh, Chris, uh, quick question. Have you had the opportunity to revisit the models that uh, were deployed? Um, it's been a while since I've been there. Um, yeah, for you. So e e either with the um, with McLaren or even with yeah, the aircraft use case, have you had the opportunity to revisit them? Or are they still running as per what you originally designed? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I think the aircraft landings, um, um, we didn't, we didn't have any follow-up as to um, um, what the page it had. Um, we, we were actually funded by uh, Euro Control. Um, yeah, we just um, passed the algorithms over to them and um, it was up to them really how they use them. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, some, 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 some of our work has been uh, has been used. We were doing a, uh, did some work with uh, Tolbert on um, uh, working with a private 
was so shy of hunting it. And, um, we designed uh, algorithms for them to uh, actually uh, create um, um, blocks of work for the drivers. And, uh, they're actually using uh, the stuff that uh, we designed. Um, no, the, thank you. The thank company you. taken over my National Express terms, um, actually yes, I'm publishing it with the uh, difficulties. Uh, that's brilliant. No, thank you very much. Yeah, found the, the the talk very insightful, uh, and the application slant on it as well. Thanks again to Spiridon, uh, our doctoral speakers, and and to all our attendees. Many thanks for making the time to join us um, today. Very much appreciate your engagement uh, um, for the presentations and the questions that. Uh, and we'll put to the speakers. A very special thanks to Emma, uh, Caitlin, Seb, and the OR Society staff for yeah, the delivery of today's event. Thank you. And um, I will bring this event to a close. So look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Gilbert. Bye. Okay. Right. Bye. Thank you.